We are joined today by Tom DiLorenzo, author of The Real Lincoln, as well as Lincoln Unmasked and many other books on other historical and economic topics. In addition, a professor of economics at Loyola University in Baltimore. This book of yours sold a great many copies. It hit number two overall on Amazon, not not in nonfiction, but overall. I mean, that includes fiction books. It includes books promoted by Oprah. It includes cookbooks. And you hit number two with this book. It's unbelievable, given that it's exactly the opposite of what people are told to believe about Lincoln. Why do you think a book like this has made you into such a lightning rod? One reason is a lot of people don't like to admit that they've been made fools of their entire lives by the educational system. And rather than confront reality, they strike out at the messenger. And I think it's basic human nature on the part of some people. Although I've had hundreds of emails, maybe thousands over the years, from people who told me, well, yeah, I originally felt like that. But then I just come to think that, thank goodness, I learned these things before it was too late, you know, before I'm dead. And you know, I can pass these on to my children and grandchildren. So it's not everybody. Of course, I have a lot of fans. As you said, I did sell a lot of books, and it's still selling pretty well. And then, of course, uh, all the political parties have deified Lincoln for 150 years. And so he really is the face of the American state. It's what gives the American state uh, moral authority, especially the neocons. And so any criticism of any kind whatsoever, no matter how minor, it's always met with a, a sort of an organized barrage of letters to the editor and perilous charges against the author of the criticisms and, and so forth. So I think those are the two main reasons. All right, so this really gets to the heart of it then. Why is Lincoln, in particular, why is he deified by the political parties? Why is he somebody who's considered to be off limits? What does he represent for the regime that they want to preserve and they don't want an iconoclast like Tom DiLorenzo tearing down? As you know, Tom, the, at the beginning of the American Republic, the big political debate was over a centralized or consolidated monopoly state, which the Hamiltonians wanted, or the Federalists, versus the decentralized, limited government of Jefferson. And that battle was played out for many decades, and the Hamiltonians finally won with Lincoln. Now, we've got a highly centralized state. The rights of secession and nullification were effectively destroyed. Uh, we had the first income tax, the first military draft during the so, uh, so-called Civil War, and an explosion of government compared to what it had been before the Civil War. And there's even a liberal law professor named Fletcher who wrote a book on Lincoln and the Constitution where he praises to the treetops the fact that Lincoln provided a sort of a roadmap of how a president can just plain ignore the Constitution and essentially declare himself dictator and use the military to intimidate judges and members of Congress. As you know, Lincoln had his biggest critic in Congress, Clement Vallandigham, a congressman from Dayton, Ohio, deported. And he also uh, intimidated federal judges, even the chief justice, by threatening to have him arrested after he wrote an opinion that Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus was unconstitutional. And so he, he attacked the separation of powers, he ignored the Constitution, and I think statists of all kinds, whether they're the neocons today or the Obamunists, as I call them, I think that's why they love the idea of idolizing Lincoln, because he was our dictator. All right, Tom, I want you to pretend that we're there's a debate going on over Lincoln, it's a formal debate, and you have your opening statement. I want you, in that opening statement, give me the 30-second version of the traditional sort of schoolboy version of Lincoln, and then take another minute and a half to just, in the most basic terms, chip away at it. Well, the traditional schoolboy interpretation of Lincoln that I was taught growing up in the Pennsylvania public schools was that uh, uh, he suffered his entire life uh, thinking about the poor slaves in the South, and he finally got a chance to do something about it by becoming president. And, uh, and, uh, and then the, the reality is that Lincoln admitted he never said a word about slavery until the mid-1850s when it, when it became politically opportunistic to say something about slavery. But he never opposed southern slavery. He opposed the extension of slavery into the territories. And uh, the reasons he gave for that was, one, they wanted to preserve the territories for free white labor. Those are his exact words. So it was political protectionism. He wanted to pr promise the white male workers that they would not allow any black people to compete with them for jobs, free or slave. And his own state, for example, amended its constitution to prohibit the immigration of black people into the state, and Lincoln supported that. 
And when he became president, anybody can just read his first inaugural address to find out uh, why he decided he needed to go to war. He bent over backwards defending slavery uh, in the first inaugural address. I call it his slavery forever speech. He even pledged his support of a constitutional amendment that would have uh, prohibited the government from ever interfering with slavery uh, uh, ever in his first inaugural address. But when it came time to tax collection, he said there will be uh, uh, there need to be no bloodshed or invasion of any state. He used the words bloodshed and invasion to describe what would happen if any state seceded and failed to continue paying federal tariff taxes. So he literally threatened uh, waging war on his own people over tax collection in the same speech where he gave uh, the strongest defense of slavery ever made by an American politician because it came from the president. And then he commenced uh, the waging of total war against civilian populations of the South. And so he really opened the door to uh, the horrors of total war in the 20th century. Tom, I want to review just generally what some of the critics said to you when your book came out. It seems like they couldn't decide whether the way to respond to you was to say, look, DiLorenzo isn't saying anything new about Lincoln. He's just saying things that all historians already know about Lincoln. And then on the other hand, you have people saying the completely contradictory thing that, oh, that DiLorenzo, all he does is distort Lincoln. Well, well which is it? Is he, is he telling us things that all professional historians already know? Or is he distorting the Lincoln legacy? Like, did you notice that basically the complaints fell into these two mutually contradictory categories? You know, I've read quite a lot of the so-called Lincoln literature. And, and, and what it is is, you know, the, uh, the historians can all, all know these facts. The references in my book, the 550 footnotes, are almost exclusively scholarly publications, university press books journal articles, things like that. So the historians know these things, but they spent 150 years putting the politically correct spin on all these facts. And so uh, I come along, and with my background in Austrian economics and uh, libertarianism and public choice and political economy, make some real obvious statements about how a lot of these interpretations are about Lincoln. I can recall a week after the book came out, I had an email from Paul Craig Roberts, the syndicated columnist, and he said, uh, you destroyed their human capital. That's why they're attacking you. What he meant by that is I had a different interpretation of the same fact. I'll give one example. Doris Kearns Goodwin, who sort of established herself as the high priestess of the Lincoln cult, uh, in her book, Team of Rivals, a big, fat, thousand-page book, uh, she, she uh, talks about how Lincoln was actually the author of the Corwin Amendment that would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering in southern slavery. And it was named after an Ohio congressman named Corwin. So she she uses primary sources to document that this came from Lincoln, who went who instructed William Seward, you know, this was after he was elected, but before he was inaugurated, to get this amendment through the Senate, which he did, and, and the House, and, and the House also. And then, but her spin on it, is that is not that, oh my goodness, we've been misinformed about Lincoln. He was not such a champion of emancipation after all. But why? Look what he did. He, he was willing to in, ingrain slavery explicitly in the Constitution. That's the interpretation that I gave in my book. But what she said uh, in her book is, no, we should praise Lincoln for this because it helped keep the Republican Party together, and that was very important, to keep the Republican Party together. And so you have thousands of spins like this of these same facts that are sort of the official doctrine of the history profession, and most of them are totally misinformed or uninformed by any kind of economic understanding. And so when I talk about Lincoln and tariffs and taxes and protectionism, the historians get especially angry with me over that because all they have said really is that he was a good-hearted man and he wanted everyone to prosper like he had prospered. That's the basis of their economic analysis of Lincoln's policies. All right, let me throw at you the most common argument that the man on the street might come back with, which would be, Look, I agree with you. Lincoln had various motivations for the things he did, and he was by no means an abolitionist, and he was willing to accept slavery in some circumstances if he could get other things that he wanted. I'll accept all that, and I'll even accept that for a year and a half into the war, he wasn't even interested in getting rid of slavery. Even then, he would have taken the southern states back and not said a word about slavery. I'm willing to go with you on all that. 
But the war gave an extra push to the abolition of slavery. And in the absence of that, there is no indication whatsoever that the slave system was in any way dying out or not prospering. So, yes, it's true. We can talk all day long about the problems with Lincoln. But the fact is the slaves were freed and there does not appear to have been any serious prospect of their emancipation in the absence of the war. So what would you say to that? First of all, anybody who's interested in this question should read Jim Powell's book entitled Greatest Emancipation, describing how all the other countries of the world ended slavery peacefully during the 19th century without a war. And then also, it was understood by a lot of people at the time that Southern secession provided a huge boost to the downfall of slavery because it would have made the Fugitive Slave Act inconsequential. The Fugitive Slave Act was a federal law that was very strongly supported by Abe Lincoln that forced Northerners to run down runaway slaves and essentially return them to their owners. If the southern states had seceded, that would have been defunct. And so a slave from Virginia, for example, if, if he escaped into Pennsylvania, he would be a free man forever. Whereas under the Lincoln regime, if that slave escaped into Pennsylvania, he had a federal bounty on his head. And that's why the Underground Railroad ended up in Canada and not, not some northern state. And so uh, a real statesman uh, would have done what the British did and the French and the Danes and the Dutch and ended slavery peacefully through some sort of compensated emancipation. All the northern states did it that way. There were slaves in New York City until 1853. And so uh, I've never bought the idea that it was absolutely impossible for the southern states to do what all the rest of the world, including the northern states, did and put an end to slavery peacefully. 